Okay, we're going to get started um, here today. Thank you for joining us here for Patent Litigation uh, 2024. This is a part of the IP Watchdogs Master Series. Um, Masters refers to the level of speaker that we're going to have here at the program today, not necessarily that we're going to convey any kind of a master's degree onto you all. <laughs> but thank you for, for joining us. We have a preliminary uh, panel. We are having some trouble with the microphones. It looks as if... The, um, everything is being recorded properly, so we'll during the break I'll try and figure it out. It is undoubtedly one switch that is so obvious that in the heat of the moment trying to start on time, I can't figure it out. So we'll get that fixed for the next round of panels. So we'll just ask Steve and Scott to speak a little bit louder if we can. Um, so thank you for joining us all. We're going to spend the next 48 hours or thereabouts talking about patent litigation. And uh, this is the panel that is going to kind of set the stage for us. It is a build as being a conversation about the issues and cases to matter that matter, what to watch moving forward, what has happened that you need to know about. And um, what we'll do is we're going to talk about a handful of things that happened last week, which are not exactly mentioned on the uh, agenda. This is a CLE. Um, segment so it, the CLE materials are on the panel page which you can access and just make sure if you need CLA that you signed in and that you will sign out Renee can help you with that so with that introduction let me begin by introducing the the panel uh, to first here from your left to right we have Steve McBride Steve is a partner at Carmichael IP Carmichael IP although not the largest firm is uh, year in and year out, the number one or number two firm for IPRs representing patent owners. So if you're a patent owner, you need to talk to Carmichael IP. So thanks for being here, Steve. And next to Steve is Scott McCune. Scott probably needs no introduction to any patent conference, but he is the proprietor of uh, patentspostgrant.com. He is now a shareholder and a uh, leader in the DC office for Wolf Greenfield. And he uh, has, I believe, still appeared in more IPRs than uh, anyone, any single attorney. And he is a uh, docket, which may, may surprise you. He does represent patent owners, He's probably about one third patent owners and two thirds uh, challengers. So um, always glad to have you gentlemen here with us today. Why don't we begin by um, giving us your perspective. When, when I in, invite somebody to join a panel, I find that they usually have something in mind that they want to say. Uh, so let's get that thing out, the perspective out, the big picture out that you'd like to share with the audience, and then we can go in the conversation from there. Steve, let's start with you. Uh, thanks, Gene. I appreciate it. So yeah, I guess the, the NPRM that, that came out last week and um, uh, the interview select has been on my, case, uh, my thought, my mind as well. So um, one of the big pictures that I've been dealing with is just this obvious this type double patenting issue that is, has kind of reared out of nowhere lately. Um, it's a big issue, and I think I think a lot of patent owners are um, uh, pretty concerned about it. Scott? Yeah, you know, double patenting, you know, last week was kind of the week of double patenting, not only because of the uh, NPRM that was issued, but there was also an interesting case at the Federal Circuit, especially if you're in the life sciences space, uh, an Allergan argument. Um, last week that that's worth listening to uh, with a slightly different spin on the select fact pattern as to you know does select just stand for the proposition that uh, you know you just can't have two different patent terms for indistinct claims or or does the timing of, of when you get that PTA matter so that case in particular I think is is worth watching um, you can never really tell Listening to the oral argument, uh, you know, which way the panel is likely to go, but there seemed to at least be a little bit of back and forth between uh, the judges on the panel. So, you know, suddenly double patenting has become, uh, you know, very uh, noteworthy, um, you know, especially over the last year between select. Now we have the notice of proposed rulemaking from the patent office. We have 
ongoing cases, Allergan being one of them. There's a second select case that's following the first select case, which gets into a, a slightly different fact pattern about patents that, that expire on the same day. So, um, you know, double patenting has, has become, uh, you know, very pronounced, uh, you know, here over the past year or so. It is an election year, of course. So I think, uh, you know, especially practicing in D.C., we tend to look at legislative developments as well yeah that that stuff's there every year and and we're not going to worry about it too much uh you know coming up on a lame duck session there will be some uh i think significant push behind para and the prevail act and and so uh you know at least for the general voting public while patent issues tend to be all not all that interesting or all that valuable from an election perspective uh you know when you talk about a lame duck session, you know, people can can slip a few things past the goalie. So there there is a lot happening politically. And so I've got my eye on a, a number of things. OK, I, I was I was listening um, and I think we've solved the microphone issue. Yes. Um, I think there was, in, believe it or not, interference with the board with the TV, oh, wow. uh, w which we will have to figure that out, because as soon as the TV went on, this started jumping around and, and acting uh, differently. So. Um, Let's let's start with the double patenting because that's the, the the biggest issue here, uh, or at least of, of recently, and it's one that probably a lot of people don't even know happened because it happened on Thursday or Friday. And so the patent office is issued these rules. I'm not really sure where these rules actually came from, why they're trying to do it. Scott, maybe you could fill us in on that if you know, or Steve, if you have any ideas. But what, and I haven't gone through it with a, with you know, a precision. It's, it's a bit longer, but they say right up front on about the third page of the Federal Register notice that the intention here is to make it cheaper and easier for challenging entities to invalidate patent claims. And, you know, they don't hide it. And that's, that's almost a, a, a direct quote from the Federal Register notice. And, um, their idea of how to do this is, is maybe we take a step back and quickly review double patenting. If you get a double patenting rejection of the obviousness type, what you do is you file a terminal disclaimer and you say, okay, well, we'll have these, tie these patents together and we agree that if the term is different, would have been different for the second application, that it will end as of the date of the underlying application that I'm tying it to. Seems reasonable, right? What they're now saying is, is that if you file a terminal disclaimer, you have to agree that if any single claim of the first patent is invalidated, all of the claims in the tied patent are invalidated. So I don't know where that even comes from. There's no notion under U.S. law that would support that. It, it, certainly unenforceability goes patent by patent. Sometimes even the unenforced, the fraud can be so stank that it could touch the whole portfolio but invalidity is supposed to be claim by claim and i don't understand in the second patent it would seem to me that a lot of those claims will be more narrow than in the the first patent um maybe not always but in a lot of cases they would be i what's the thought process this guy we'll start with you do you, do you have any insight into what they're <clears throat> trying to do and why yeah, well, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, there's the, you know, where, where is it coming from? There's the stated reason, and then there's maybe reading the tea leaves, the real reason. Uh, the stated reason in the rule package is, well, the public has asked for this, right? Um, we've received comments, we being the agency, uh, that there's a lot of litigation out there, and there's indistinct claims, and it's like whack-a-mole, right? You kill one claim, and then another patent pops up. And yes, there's collateral estoppel, and you can litigate that in the courts, but it's really expensive. And you know, wouldn't it be wouldn't it, wouldn't it be great if we had a way to just say, look, these claims are really the same, and you know, let's be done with it. So that that's kind of the stated reason is that, uh, you know, in the predictable arts, right? There's these bad actors out there that have these patent thickets, and you kill one patent, sometimes they go back. Uh, even after, for example, uh, you know, a, a successful IPR, they get another patent that says more or less the same thing. And so that's the stated reason for, you know, this, this rule package. And then there's reading the tea leaves, which is, well, if you look at what the agency's been doing over the past year, 
with some other rule packages is they've, they've structured fees to because they want to get away from certain behavior, right? So suddenly, terminal disclaimers, the filing fee is now graduated based upon your timing. Uh, you know, continuation filings, you know, we're going to structure those fees to sort of, you know, punish is not the right word, but encourage people to do things faster. It's, it's, it's almost as if, you know, you go back to the old continuation rule package that was shot down because the agency didn't have substantive rulemaking. Well, let's just get at this another way. Mm -hmm. Let's start tweaking the fees and maybe we can drive the behavior that way. So the stated reason is because of bad actors. You know, maybe the real reason is, you know, a little bit of the administration, that being right, the, the Biden administration trying to get to drug pricing and what they believe are evergreening of, you know, certain pharmaceutical industries, life sciences. So they can't touch that because that's going to explode in their face. So which it may happen anyway with this rule package. But I think the cover, so to speak, the political cover is, you know, we're giving the public something what they want. And this is really about, you know, addressing bad actors when the real rationale may be more about sort of trying to structure the system away from practices that life sciences have been taking advantage of. Yeah, I mean, I, that's as good a guess as any. I think it, it, so much of what the Biden administration is doing anymore does relate to, at least in our space, does relate to drug pricing, right? They, they see patents as the reason why medicines cost so much, which, you know, we don't necessarily need to go in depth to that. We we will at our life sciences program in the fall, and we did last fall, and Corey Sandberg from uh, Novartis laid, laid out, you know, like the, the federal government puts in less than 1%, and, it's, and I think it's even less than 0.1% of what is spent um, on drugs, and he said that Novartis alone spends more in research and development than the entire NIH budget, um, and at least for this, at least for this piece of the budget for the research and development. And uh, he said he suspects all companies of the same size spend the same amount, and if larger companies probably are spending a lot more. I mean, this is not <laughs> none of this is going to change drug drug prices. It's just. It's, it seems to me to be a little bit nonsensical. Steve? Yeah, yeah, I would agree with it. I mean, the, that very well may be the, the purpose behind it, but it, but going through it, going at it through the judicially created uh, doctrine of obviousness type double patenting is, is such a strange way to to get at this issue because it seems like this is a doctrine that, that, that really needs less emphasis going forward rather than, than, than kind of creating traps for, for uh, patent applicants. Yeah, and I was sharing uh, with some folks um, in the in the back before we we started, um, and um, about double patenting. And I've had talks with over the years, many years. This is not in since this came out last week, with people from the patent office talking about double patenting. And if you haven't read the manual of patent examining procedures, chapter eight hundred on double patenting, and you suffer from insomnia, I'm convinced that's the cure <laughs> for insomnia. There is no more dense reading in the MPEP than chapter 800. And it could be just like 10 pages or less if they would actually have double patenting be an obviousness, uh, obviousness doctrine. And they don't see it as an obviousness doctrine. And I don't understand why that is. Because if I was to try and get the same claim that Scott was going to get double patenting on, and, and we'll give it to Scott, but if Gene wanted to get the same claim, I would get a 103 obviousness rejection based on your reference plus whatever other references the examiner. So it seems to me that double patenting should be conceptually about, are you willing to remove your own reference from this obviousness inquiry on the front end or on the back end in lit litigation? Do we count your own reference or do we not count your own reference against you? And if you were willing to file a terminal disclaimer, then we have agreed that we're not going to count it against you. But here, it's, well, we're not going to count it against you right up until we see the opportunity to take all your claims away. And my fear here is, is that, and we've seen this in patent law a lot over the last generation, this is going to be so effective if it gets in that they're going to say, well, why should we just leave it to double patenting? What we're going to do is, is if you lose any claim, the parent, any claim in a parent because it's invalid, then all of the family is going to be invalid. 
I mean, because I don't conceptually see any difference, Scott. Well, I mean, let, let's say this rule goes forward. No one is filing that disclaimer. So what it's really going to do is you're going to get that rejection and say, well, I guess I got to cancel one of these claims because, you know, if I have 60 claims mm -hmm. in this application and one of them happens to conflict with another patent, I'm not going to subject all those 60 claims to fall if that other flame, right. that other claim. So you're, you you're just going to you're going to cancel it. Yeah. And so, you know, again, it's I think it's more about driving behaviors. And, you know, you, you could also look at it as well. You know, maybe this is sort of like a negotiation, right, where the agency is throwing out the extreme idea. And then in the final rule, they'll come back and they'll say, OK, well, forget about the whole patent. It's just going to be right length claims will we'll, we'll mm -hmm. die together. I don't think that's the goal. Um, I mean, li like I said, w when you start tweaking the fees for the, the terminal disclaimers and the continuations, and, you know, this is about changing behaviors and forcing applicants really to get away from claiming, you know, having indistinct claims across multiple patents because no one is going to risk an entire claim set when it's just one of, you know, 60 claims. Yeah. Steve, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, I mean... Uh, the, if this goes forward, the idea of you know agreeing to a terminal disclaimer is just out the door. Whether you're canceling, whether you're fighting it, whether you're you're changing your claim drafting practice to start with um, to avoid that. So um, I agree with a lot of what Scott said. I think it's um, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's going to change practice if this happens. Yeah, you know. So l let me ask you both of you this: Do you think? This, even in a perfect world, do you think that this can happen? I mean, I look at the calendar and I don't see, um, because, and we all watch the patent system like, you know, like it's a laboratory animal, right? Um, so the one thing that some of you who don't do it quite that way, and a lot of you here in the audience are, but when this goes out to the broader audience, you know, you'll get some people who don't watch the machinations in DC or, or you know, Alexander quite like we do. And what you will find for sure is is that since we're in a presidential election year, somewhere during the month of August, and if not in August, certainly by September, there will be a blackout put on all of the agencies because they are not going to risk losing an election because somebody from the patent office said or did something the wrong people didn't like. Or, you know, and it's not just the patent office, you know, Department of Interior or this or that. They can't lose an election or lose a donation because of something peripheral to the, the, the bigger picture that is the U.S. government. So they put a, a gag order. So I look at the, it's, it's May 13. That gag order is maybe three months away. Comments are open for two. Yeah, I mean, and, so. and they got to comment, and then they got to revise what they get yeah. back, and then the wild card is OMB has to look at all of this and give it the yeah. the go forward, and, and that's that's what happened under the last administration. Director Yanku is trying to get some fintive rules through, and it just just ran out of time. Um, you know, you the comments are due July 9th. Typically, that would be extended when you have a holiday right mm -hmm. beforehand they can't really extend it and, and have any hope of, of, of getting this thing forward. I, you know, frankly, I would be shocked if it, if it went forward just because, you know, life sciences is going to go crazy over this. You're going to get an avalanche of comments coming mm -hmm. in in July. You've got the end of the fiscal year, so the agency is already, you know, insanely busy at that time. So the odds of them getting a final rule package out before October is, is you know, pretty close to zero and so there there's that aspect of it of just running out of time and then having to go through OMB and then you know presumably director Vidal is going to be gone you've got an interim director but more importantly a lot of these rule packages that have been coming out the, the patent office doesn't seem to be able to read the room and and what I mean by that is you know Tillis and Coons Senator Tillis and Coons are driving a lot of policy legislative proposals uh, between the two of them and Senator Leahy, they sort of put Director Vidal in that seat. Senator Leahy is gone. He was sort of the hawkish one of that group. And I'm not bashing either Senator Tillis and Coons, but the fact of the matter is, is they get more uh, lobbying money from Biopharma than any other senators in this country. The odds of them sitting back and allowing this to happen is, is pretty much zero. Well, and also, as I just got into this with the whole Bidol thing, even if it goes through, even if it happens, Given the time for when this would go final, 
there's the Congressional Review Act that if Congress doesn't have 60 working days to disapprove of any regulation, then that resets at the beginning of the next year. And the importance of that winds up being that, you know, at the beginning of the next year, we very well could have a new president and uh, a new Congress around. And this is the type of thing in our space that it is not political, not R&D political. You're going to have Tillis and Coons on the same page here and a lot of Democratic senators on the same page with a lot of Republican senators on, on this issue. And um, while the Biden administration who is pushing this, obviously Biden would not sign a congressional disapproval if trump wins and the congress disapproves of this type of regulation because it so impacts the bio pharma community then it gets overturned and the importance of getting overturned can't be understated because if you look at the congressional review act what it says is is that if congress disapproves of a regulation then that regulation and anything substantially similar to that regulation can no longer be implemented by the agency unless there's specific authorizing legislation from Congress. So it almost is the silver bullet. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very unlikely that this goes forward, but if this is a rule that impacts your business, you can't really rely on that, right? You, you've got to come out guns blazing on this comment period. Um, Will there be lawsuits? Well... Has to be a rule first. Likely, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to get it to 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 a rule first. But um, you know, if if a final rule package were to issue with some kind of imminence that you know 30 days this is going to go into effect, that would be the time that you would see the lawsuits. Um, but you know, like I said, if if you're in the life science pharmaceutical space where this could be a a huge issue for you, you, you know, you you've got to do the homework now and make sure that uh, you know that avalanche of comments is. Uh, sending the message yeah okay so let, let's uh and i just wanted to go back to something you said so you say kathy vidal is likely going to be gone and i i don't want to leave that hanging and let people think that you've already elected president no, trump no i have not so so uh, which he very well i mean if the polls are right today then he's he's ahead but um that's today you know the elections in five months six months what did you mean by that well, it's just tradition, right? Um, the director, regardless of the election outcome, tenders their resignation, and uh, it's just the way it's been working. I think Director Vidal said publicly, if I recall, that, that that's her intention as well. Um, so, you know, presumably as of January or February, we would have an interim director for at least, uh, you know, if history is any guide, probably for the next 12 to 18 months, which... Yeah you know, has, has become a problem, which is a different topic. The reason that we're getting all these rule packages at the end of someone's tenure is because by the time they get in the seat and start doing these things, and it takes two years to get them across the finish line, uh, you know, this has suddenly become this recurring problem that, we, that we've seen start with Iancu and now Director Vidal. So, um, you know, the, the expectation is that the resignation will come and we'll be talking about, like I said, an interim director. Yeah. So, Steve, let's pivot, and I know you've done some writing for us on, on IP Watchdog, and you've looked at it a lot about the uh, the NPRM on the PTAB rules. Um, and, I, you know, obviously both of you gentlemen do a lot of PTAB uh, work. Scott, I think you also do some district court litigation as well. Do you do any – you're 100% you're PTAB? Mostly PTAB, yeah. Okay. And the appeals to the federal circuit that and relate the to it. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, mostly. So – what say you about this NPRM on the PTAB? So a lot of it is not controversial. Um, I think the part that is giving a lot of people heartache is is the uh, discretionary denial briefing. And I'm not sure it's so much that, that petitioners are getting a right to um, to a briefing. I think I think more of it is is the timing and the contents of the briefing that the patent owner has to put out, moving it out of the preliminary response. Uh, where the patent owner has 70 or 80 pages to talk about it, um, and also moving it to a time period that is is a month before the preliminary response is due, and then saying, okay, you have 10 pages, patent owner, to talk about discretionary denial, when you may have two or three discretionary denial issues you want to bring up in your briefing. Um, oh, no, by the way, you need to rely on your preliminary response, which hasn't been filed yet, for the, any merits issues you have to uh, analyze. So I think that's that's the problem that is causing um, uh patent owners a lot of problems, not only because of the, of the timing of the, uh, of, the, of the briefing, but also because there's just not that much left to a preliminary response anymore. 
Um, discretionary denial is, is one of the main things you address there. Um, after SAS, you only, you only really, if you're going to address, I mean, I mean preliminary responses have always been discretionary. Um, you don't have to file one. But after SAS, if you're going to um, put something in there, it has to be a cut across technical argument, a merits argument. It has to be cut across. So that went away after SAS. Um, the, you know, the, the, the claim by claim analysis of, of merits, it, it doesn't really happen for, for us anymore. I mean, maybe some people still do it. Um, so one of the big things that's remaining is discretionary denial issues. So it's almost like what's the point of the preliminary response now if you're going to um, implement this rule? Um, and I think there's other issues. I think one, one other thing before we move on is um, there is, is are some, some, some regulations uh, relating to serial and parallel petitions. And one of the weird things is that Parallel petitions are, are being under this NPRM done on a uh, on a per patent basis, and serial petition li limiting serial petitions is done on a claim by claim basis, and and I think that does cause the possibility that there may be some um, uh, maybe some 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 bad acting on petitioners in terms of of, of leveraging that serial uh, the, the limits on serial petitions are only on a claim by claim basis. So I think there's still an opportunity there that, that we'll probably um, put in some comments about. Okay. Scott, your thoughts on, on it? Yeah, this is one of the, the things that the Patent Office has done when I mean that, you know, they, they don't do a good job of reading the room. Um, you know, the proposal is essentially codify some serial petitioning, parallel petitioning practices that, you know, essentially the, the board's already doing. That's fine. Um, but when you get into this discretionary stuff, um, you know, at the 35,000 foot level, you say, well, I've got a petition and I've got to put all this discretionary stuff in it. It'd be great if I didn't have to take away from my merit arguments and I could put it someplace else. Yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. But when you get into the actual nuts and bolts of what they proposed, so, you know, as a petitioner, you don't have to put all of that in there. Great. As a patent owner, uh, you know, now you've got, instead of a three-month deadline for your preliminary response, now you have two months where you have to file the separate paper on your discretionary denial issue, so that's 325, 314A, um, so you have to get all of that done faster. The petitioner now has an opportunity as a matter of right to file a response, which they never had before. So now you're accelerating something. Uh, you're giving the petitioner a response as a matter of right. The preliminary response, as Steve points out, usually you don't want to talk about your claims or, you know, to, to get into that stuff because you're trying to avoid this thing without any damage to your patent. So now... You're cramming all of this into 10 pages, and a month later when it comes time for your preliminary response, now maybe you don't have much to put in there. So the optics of that are not ideal for a patent owner. So all of this, you know, adds up on, on the patent owner side to, you know, a fairly significant detriment for an agency that has a bit of a PR problem when it comes to patent owners. So I don't understand um, why they would propose something like this. Like I said, for, as someone who files a lot of petitions, is it helpful? Yeah, it's helpful to me. Would I die without it? No. You know, mm -hmm. it's not that big a deal to, to me when I'm filing a petition. So, um, you know, you're providing a little bit of value to petitioners, but it's costing patent owners a lot more. So I don't understand, um, you know, where this comes from. And, and maybe the compromise will be okay. Instead of 10 pages, we'll give you 20 or something like that. But you know, ultimately, you know, even as a petitioner, do I now want to deal with two separate papers in the preliminary proceeding? You know, probably not. Um, so it's, it, it just it seems It can't like hurt the bill, though, right? I mean, as <laughs> things get more complicated, it always is to our benefit. Well, it, it, it messes up the budgeting. It and does. It's just and, you know, the thing, and Steve, I oh, see so you want to come in. I'll get you a chance in a minute. But, you know, the thing, one of the criticisms, and I'm sure you've gotten this a lot, Scott, as, as a writer, people will say, oh, you're just complaining about this rule because it's going to take work away from the lawyers. It's No, no. Any of these regulations, any of these <laughs> yeah. pieces of legislation, they're, they're full employment act. Yeah, the petitioner now is an extra filing, and the patent owner now is an extra filing. Yeah. Steve. Yeah, yeah, and I was just going to follow on with what Scott said. Is if, if this was just the right to a petitioner file a reply to the uh, to, to the discretionary denial issues, that probably wouldn't be that controversial. But but messing up what, what's going on with the preliminary response and doing it in a manner that makes it more difficult for patent owners to respond, I think, is the real yeah. what's really uh, driving the backlash. And, and just sort of pulling this back to to the litigation perspective. So this rule package was a result of the advance notice of proposed rulemaking, which came over a year ago that had just a pile of, of conflicting ideas in it. And, uh, and it just sort of gets back to the point I made earlier about 
directors not being in the seat long enough to really move things forward. Director Iancu tried to get Fintiv codified, couldn't get it codified. Uh, Fintiv uh, was proposed in the ANPRM to codify that. That's been pulled out. So now we're going to go on to a third director where we don't have Fintiv codified. And what that means for litigators is, you know, a year from now, when you're filing petitions and you're in Texas or you're in the ITC, you're going to have a new director coming in that might issue a new memo that says, forget about all that stuff Director Vidal said. We're going to now crank this back up to where it was when D Director Iancu was in the seat. And so now there's going to be more discretionary denials. And regardless of the election outcome, that's my expectation because the people that are putting the next director in the seat are the ones that are actively drafting the Prevail Act right now, which is Senator Tillerson Coons, and which is very pro-patent donor. And so you get this constant back and forth on policy because we're not able to get these regulations in place. So a year from now, if you're litigating in Texas, um, you know, you may have another get out of jail free card at the PTAB because of the next director that's coming in is more than likely going to be on the, the patent owner side of that equation. Yeah, well, it certainly will be if, if President Trump wins. And it likely, I think, will be, like you say, even if President mm -hmm. Biden wins the second term. Um, okay, so you, you brought up the prevail. One of the things that we wanted to talk about were uh, prevail and para and the what we're constantly told here, at least in the inside the Beltway in D.C., is the soon-to-be-introduced Restore Act, which would overrule eBay, but that's been soon to be introduced now for a year or two, at least a year. They've been working on it for a lot longer, but it's it's imminent for the last year, right, Scott? That's soon to be introduced to the trash can because that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the odds of, uh, you know, doing away with eBay are, you know, again, pretty close to zero. Yeah. yeah. Steve, what do you think about uh, any of those, any of those three? Para prevail, or the I, yeah, I don't see a way forward. Uh, you know, in, the, in this Congress, for all three, really. Um, I mean, I think prevail. Who knows what restore is ultimately going to be, or, or, or if that comes out. But um, yeah, prevail and para both. Uh, I think generally good rules packages. I think you know, I, I would support their passage in some some form that is is similar to what it is. Obviously. Uh, obviously, para is about 101. Um, Prevail is about uh, PTAB practices. So um, both do a lot to to alleviate a lot of the concerns uh, patent owners and others have about um, uh, about those practices today. So I, I think they're both good practices. I think maybe we need to look a, a little bit closer at, at the actual language um, that's being used. But but in general, I'm supportive of the two. But that being said, I don't know that there's a way forward in this Congress, given the timing. Uh, you know, there's opportunity, given it's a lame duck session, but, you know, th there's there's other priorities, uh, you know, for the election, legalizing certain aspects of cannabis and all that stuff, which is going to help, you know, certain campaigns. And, and you know, how do you get the time? And, and more importantly, how do you sell something like that to, to the American people, which is, you know, the Prevail Act was previously the Stronger Patents Act for years. And so... You know, campaigning on we're going to make patents stronger doesn't doesn't you know charge anyone up outside of this room. But uh, so they've tried to repackage that. And That's probably why they changed the name. Well, right. they changed the name and they said, well, this is about fighting China. So yeah, maybe you get a little bit more political bang for your buck there. But uh, you know that doesn't seem to to have worked either. Um, you know, Para I think is probably in the best shape and has the, the you know the best likelihood of moving forward. The problem is, like every other piece of legislation that's come through on IP, is is you just it's the Hatfields and the McCoys, and you've got the independent inventors coming out against it for reasons that make absolutely no sense, but they just keep repeating them. And you know, you have law professors who don't like the idea of erasing a hundred years of of you know uh, law review articles and things. So. You know, there, there's there's a number of constituencies that are they're unhappy with para that probably shouldn't be. Um, you know, the, the argument is, well, it's not perfect. Well, even if it fixes 80 percent of the problem we have right now, it's bits better than zero. Um, but I just there, there's an opportunity there. But with so many other things going on and this election shaping up to be an absolute disaster, I just don't see anything getting through by the yeah. end of the year. You raise a good point there. I mean, if it's. If this is if this is if Paris is something to to be done for 
patent owners, and there are significant chunks of that population that are against it, then why is Congress going to do anything? Yeah. You know, and that's, the, that's one of the problems with what the inventors are, are, are doing. Um, I've been told that um, they, uh, well, I could probably s say the, the names, that um, Senator Cruz is not going to take any position on any patent bill, and uh, Representative uh, Chip Gilroy, also of Texas, is not going to take any position on, on any bill. And, you, you know, if and Cruz is, a, is sort of a, a, as close to a patent guy once you get past Tillis and Coons in the Senate. You know, he actually, unknown to a lot of you probably, he was um, a winning – uh, won a Supreme Court argument on behalf of a patent owner back when he was an, an attorney. Um, it was a design patent case. You know, so he's as much a patent guy as anybody in the Senate. And if he's in sort of what you were just saying, Steve, you know, why am I going to do this if – if I'm going to take slings and arrows and the people I'm trying to help don't really want it, um, it, it that's the sensible approach for people on the periphery of this issue. Yeah, some of the Texas politicians in particular, for whatever reason, have have, have aligned themselves with, with some of the more extreme independent inventors group. I think there were some bills proposed where if you were a patent owner, you could just opt out of the PTAB. You know? So it, there's some silly proposals there, and for whatever reason— um, you know, there there seems to be some alignment there that that would be an additional roadblock. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's move uh, sort of a little bit of a degree away. We're still going to be talking about the 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 PTAB, but um, Intel's challenge was uh, up in front of the Supreme Court to ask them to take cert in the Intel versus Vidal case in the Supreme Court, and this was regarding the Finta factors, which we've talked about here a little bit. Uh, and the Supreme Court did not want to get involved. Can you imagine them not wanting to get involved in that <laughs> mess of a case with, with all of the things that would undoubtedly have come up about um, Open Sky and PQA and um, some of the real salaciousness of, of that? They, they deferred. Um, what, what, if anything, does that, that mean? Is that a one-off? Did they just not want to open that can of worms? Uh, where, where do we stand with, with that at the, at the moment? I, you know, you mentioned that it may be different in a year, which it very well could be, but where are we at the moment? So I think that's, that case is, has been remanded to the district court for, I mean, if they found Apple had standing and, and that um, there was a question whether the AIA, or I'm sorry, the, um, the APA um, uh, required Fintive to be codified in a rule, rule package. So that's still there. I think that's, that's where the case is right now. Um, so then that's an interesting question, if whether, you know, how that comes out. Um, and yeah, the, the district court a couple of weeks ago had said that, uh, you know, it was okay, at least under an APA analysis, because it was a holistic approach. And, you know, it wasn't really a rule. But, of course, it is a rule, right? If you look at yeah. the Fintive factors, well, as the case stayed, you know, how much effort has the district court put into it? You wouldn't be talking about any of this stuff if the case, you know, was, you know, if the case was stayed, then you're not talking about it. Right. right. Uh, so a lot of these factors really aren't aren't factors at all. Uh, so that that was uh, the decision of district court. I imagine that's going to go forward, you know, back up to to the federal circuit again. Um, so, you know, where we are right now is is, you know, Director Vidal has pulled those denial rates down by you know, five, seven percent because, uh, you know, she's she's changed uh, the, the uh, you know, the equation a little bit. If, if you if you have a compelling showing, right, it doesn't matter how close you are to trial in Texas. And the argument is, well, wait a minute, isn't it reasonable likelihood of prevailing? You know, why is compelling showing right? That's like a different standard. And I think that's probably the reason it's not in the rule package, because that would spawn a lawsuit if, if that were tr if she tried to commit that to rules. So, you know, where we are right now is you can file a stipulation and make uh, Fintive go away. You can have a compelling showing and make Fintive go away. If you're in the ITC, uh, the director said we're not going to count that. Um, so, like I said, in, in under the next administration, the compelling showing could be thrown out the window. The ITC could be thrown out the window. Um, so we could go back to essentially what we had before and we'll continue this sort of ping pong match until, you know, some kind of regulations are laid down. It really is ping pong. It's total flux, yeah. I mean, I'm almost in favor of, you know, the Federal Circuit affirming having to codify the rule into the whatever the whatever 
whatever fintive rule is, um, putting it in the Code of Federal Regulations because, yeah, I mean, it's just been administration to administration. It should be a rule, yeah. but the problem is every, you know, if you're not getting the director in the seat until two years into a presidential term. You know, you God know. help us when we're relying on the federal circuit to try and clean things up. <laughs> um, so I got a, an email. I won't say who it's from because I didn't run this by uh, the person who sent it to me. It's, it, it, let's just suffice it to say a, a, a prominent attorney whose name you would all recognize in the biopharma industry. Okay, so it's not, this is not some run of the mill kind of, it's somebody that you, you, you would all recognize. Um, and he sent me an email after the CRISPR argument at the Federal Circuit. Didn't talk about the argument at all. He talked about the panel. It was Judge Reyna, Hughes, and Cunningham. And his message was, well, these inventors are going to need to satisfy themselves with the Nobel Prize, you know, because they're just not with that panel. I mean, it's not the worst draw you could get, but it's certainly a mile away from the best draw of judges you could get if you were trying to win as a patent attorney at the federal circuit. And that provoked me to... to point to him that, you know, there really is a, a problem at the patent office regarding um, what is patentable, you know, and this is the totality of the requirements, uh, is different if what you've invented is a kitchen gadget, a tool that could be sold at Home Depot or something that you would buy on QVC. The threshold for getting a patent seems to be almost, is it a different color than what has previously existed? And if it is, and you're okay with mentioning the color in the claim, then you're going to get the patent. I mean, the threshold is, is, is so paper thin, I, I couldn't begin to articulate it to somebody who hasn't looked at these cases um, and these uh, rejections. And then on the other end of the spectrum, the more sophisticated, and I always say if, if, if you're going to try and shoot this out into outer space to orbit Neptune and send back data um, over the span of the next generation, the likelihood you're going to get a patent on that is zero because with the greater importance the invention is, the greater scientific and innovative momentum it has, the harder it is to satisfy these thresholds. And then we had last week the examiner who posted on Reddit that said, you know, I just really, because my political beliefs, don't want to give a patent to that company from Israel. Um, the, the patent office has got a real problem here, and it infects everything. Um, any thoughts on, on this generally? Or, or you d disagree with me if you want, if you if you disagree. But I about my characterization about how easy it is to get, you know, kitchen gadget patent versus something you know very sophisticated in the artificial, let's say artificial intelligence, or at least in one third of the biotech community has has a lot of trouble. Yeah, well, you know, the the patent office makes hamburger, and you have to litigate filet mignon, which is what it comes down to. There's there's just different standards there. Okay, I, uh, it's going to be hard to beat. We're on the first <laughs> panel, and that's already the quote of the program. <laughs> We've always had, uh, you know, a problem with examination quality. I, I don't know what the, you know, the solution is, right? We have hundreds of thousands of applications coming in the door. Um, we have brilliant patent examiners, and, and I prosecuted for, for years, and then you have examiners that are fresh out of engineering school. It's their first job. Um, you know, they've got limited amount of time. They certainly don't have the resources of private industry, and they, they're not going to do a great job. Um, you know, I don't know what the solution is to, to, to that issue. Um, and then when you start to take those patents and litigate them for hundreds of millions of dollars, they get all this scrutiny, especially in the unpredictable arts when you're talking about unexpected, you know, you know. Uh, expectations of success and and after Amgen enablement and all of that um, you know we've had old practices of, of claim drafting that that change uh, you know based upon what's happening in the courts and then there's a big lag there and you know all that you know huge bolus of patents that was under the old way or, you know are still out there and so you know unfortunately that's just our system but there there is I agree with Gene that there there is a perception problem in some of this um, whereas, yeah, yeah, the patent uh, patent examiners are never going to 
be as thorough as, as a district court litigation and determining validity or patentability or anything like that. But there is a perception, you know, when you have the comment about Israel and you have panel dependency issues and things like that. Um, you know, I was looking back at the director decisions this year, and I think, I think for 2024, every single one of them has been against patent owners. So there is a perception, perception issue here that is is real, and and, and it's. I, th I think a lot of it is you're part of a, of a large bureaucracy when you're in the patent office and you kind of kind of get into into like uh, office speak and, and and thinking of things that way that that doesn't doesn't apply to people in, in in private practice and we see it a lot differently and they're not sensitive to that in a lot of cases I think so I have two follow-ups for you because I'm looking at my notes and I did skip over the director review question which you just raised so I, I just maybe, said everything I have no no, no maybe, <laughs> maybe we can maybe we can hit hit on that um, but before we hit on, I ask you to talk about that Steve um, I know you represent, is it 100% patent owners at this point? Right now it is 100% okay. patent owners, yes. So when the patent owners come to you, what do you, what do you tell them? I mean, you know, because a lot of them come to me and they'll say, well, the patent office said it was good. This went through examination. It took four years for me to get the patent. Clearly this, uh, how could anybody challenge this, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, do you get that? What do you, what is your response to them? How do you, you know, talk them off the ledge? Yeah, no, I, I think most I think most patent owners understand that their patent can still be challenged and it can still be invalidated. Um, I think they but, get that conceptually, but certainly not theirs because theirs is of a different magnitude. And the examiner said so. I'm sorry but about. No, no. What I, I'm just playing the part of the the you know. I was like, well, yeah, yeah. I, I get my patent can be challenged. Oh, I, I see. You, you know, and but but that's the other guy's patent. You know, not mine. Mine. The examiner said mine was good. Yeah, you just—I mean—you just got to explain to them. You've got to go into detail, and sometimes you get at a, a panel, and then we we can we can identify these things going in and say, okay, this is—you know—we've got a rough draw here. We've got a good draw, right? And this, mm -hmm. this is what you can expect, and this is the statistics, and this is how it goes. And um, you have to explain that, that two different two different judges, two different panels may come out on the same issue very, very differently. And how how how. Many people in Congress, you suppose, get that. Very few think about patents in the first instance. Right, <laughs> two. Coons and Dillis yeah. and their staffs, yeah. right? I don't um, know if but and do you, do you, I almost think that, you know, like there's no way. I mean, even as dysfunctional as government is, there's no way if they really understood that we have uh, the ITC, we have the PTAB, we have district court, and we have examiners of all different allowance rates, some near zero, some near 95%. You know, this system is, to call it arbitrary and capricious, is insulting to things that are merely arbitrary and capricious. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, to get back to your, your other point on examiners, obviously, when you have examiners saying crazy things on the internet, that, that's unfortunate. Um, you would think at this point that there would be some kind of software, AI software, that you could analyze examiners and say, well, you've allowed one patent in five years, right? We need to take a look at what you're doing, right? You, you should be able to pluck these anomalies out. And, well, you know, why is it this company of, you know, of this type, you, you know, so, but it's the government, so they'll never get that software, you know, until we're all dead and in our graves, so. Um, and even yeah. if they had it, they wouldn't do anything with it. Yeah. Well, you've got a union, right? Right, because you know. it's, and on top of the union, um, you have to fire a civil servant, which is m harder than firing a professor with tenure. You know, it, once they get that one year, they're off probation. Mm -hmm. And and I've told uh, multiple directors, multiple commissioners, this is like back in the day, you talk to the old timers who worked at the, you know, like the people who are now unfortunately leaving us because they're, they're so old or they're, you know, our grandparents age kind of. Mm -hmm. They'll tell you that the way that directors or commissioners or, you know, people dealt with the folks who wouldn't get with the program is, is they would be transferred to, at the time, it was classification, which no computers to help. You had to read all these and just classify where does this go. And it was, a, it was, all, it was punishment. It was yeah. mind-numbingly boring. And I'm like, you need to come up with some way that these examiners who won't get with the program, and there's, they're not, by and large, like everything, most of the examiners are great. Just in every walk of life, it's always the small minority that make the majority look bad. But you got to have a, a solution for those. You know, say, hey, examiner, 
I'm not going to fire you. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you a promotion. I'm going to put you on special assignment. This is that important. What I want you to do is I want you to go through chapter 800 of the MVP and rewrite it <laughs> or something, you know. And, and, and then when they get done with that, you can throw that away and have them do the next mind-numbingly stupid thing, right? And then eventually the word goes through. You have to play with the program. Because mm -hmm. they don't. They, ha they don't have people that play with the program. They, there's no other way to uh, justify a near zero allowance rate and a near 100% allowance rate in the same office. And then w one comment, I won't tell you who told me this, but since that examiner story came up, he said, you know, this is bad for the examiners. He said, but people already believe this is going on at the PTAP, where you have some judges that fundamentally are more in favor of patents, pro-patents, and you have a lot of judges, probably the majority of them, probably two-thirds of them, it seems to be the perception, go the other way, you know, and are already predisposed to not liking patents or not liking broad patents or not, you know, being skeptical. I mean... Going back to Scott's point, I mean, we, we have those statistics. We know what they are, and I don't know if they're being used or not or mm -hmm. if you guys have heard anything about it, but that information is available. Feedback is available if... It is. Right, but we, we also have district court judges that can fall into those buckets, too. See, and that's uh, always what the patent office, you said that on purpose, right? Because that's what the patent office well, tells us. Well, but it's, you know, there's a reason people go to certain courts right. in this country, so. Right, but this, I, what I'm just trying to say, you know, and this is going to strike you all as odd. I've gotten a lot more respectful as I've gotten older, you know. So when, <laughs> when people say these boneheaded, crazy things like Scott just said, they'll tell us, oh, well, there, but there's, that happens in district court, too. It's like, okay, so, like, I smacked my sister. Well, she smacked me first. Does that make it okay? No. If you're a parent, you know the answer to that. Neither smack was good, right? So the fact that this is stupid in some district courts is not a justification for making it or keeping it or tolerating the stupidity at the patent office. Well, I think the, the rationale is it's just human nature, right? There, there will be some people that fall on one side of the fence more so. You know, it's like liberal versus conservative justices. You know, it's just the way it is. There are different you know, ideologies, and, and there's always going to be a slant one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Congress is struggling with judge shopping, which bleeds over to, you know, what's going on in Texas. And, well, why is the Trump administration or the Biden administration seeking out these, these certain judges? Yeah, it's, it's, it goes beyond patent law. But in district court, there are a whole lot of district court judges that love that West Texas and East Texas exist and that Delaware exists and that Northern California <laughs> exists, right? Because they don't want these patent cases. Why would you want to litigate on either side in front of a judge who would prefer an antitrust case? That's how bad they hate patents. Yeah. Well, yeah. They, they never go away, right? They're, they right. just take years and years. And, and whatever the judge rules is going to be wrong. <laughs> Something that they say is going to be wrong and going to get the federal circuit to reverse them. Yeah, but the the, the district three, uh, the Article Three judge thing is, I mean, that's that's a, that's a to a whole different issue than than the patent office because I feel like patent office. Yeah, I come from a from a business background, and you, you look at the te bottom ten percent, and you say you got to shape up or, or move on, right? In, in in the private industry, and and we have the information to do that with examiners without having to worry about life appointment. Um, sure. So I kind of echo what you were saying, Gene, and these are. Two wrongs don't make a right, and, and we should remedy what we can. Um, and you know, obviously, uh, court shopping, you know, is is you know something. Even though, even though I understand why patent owners do it, I, I do understand why you know why that's a problem as well. Yeah. Okay, we have about seven minutes left. I'm going to go long simply because we started a little bit late, and this is for CLE, so I want to make sure um, we stay honest with this. Does the audience have any questions? If anybody has any questions, we do have some microphones up here at the, at the front if you want to. If you don't have questions or while you might be thinking about questions, um, I can go ahead and ask also, um, do you have any thoughts on this design patent case in the future i mean it, it it maybe hasn't begun to resonate too awful much and i don't think the federal circuit has had the hear, oral hearing have they had the oral hearing yet or did they just have it recently i think it was february it was yeah, february were, okay yeah. so we're waiting the decision then we're waiting the decision and yeah. this was and 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 the case is l lkq versus gm global technology and um 
the reason this is relevant is this version of the federal circuit under Ch Chief Prost and now under Chief Moore have not had very many en banc cases. Mm -hmm. And this is the first one in a couple years. Um, so it's one that you want to look for. Do you, what can you tell us, Steve? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, that's probably the primary reason it's so interesting is that it, it was in bonk and it's been years since we've had one of those. Um, so it's basically, it goes back to KSR and then the idea that the KSR 17 years ago talked about the fact that the TSM method was too rigid for um, teaching suggestive motivation method was too rigid for obviousness and there needed to be more flexibility. So finally, somebody with a design patent comes along and says, wait a second, what, is KS, what does uh, KSR mean in the context of design patents? Um, so the challenge here is that under um, current, for, for design patents, that the current obviousness test is this, um, is this Rose and Durling test that basically has two steps. First, your primary, you have to have a primary reference that has to be basically the same as uh, whatever, your, your, um, whatever the, the, the target patent is. And, and um, second, you have to have the secondary reference has to be so related that it's, it's, it's almost indistinguishable as well in terms of, of, of putting the two together. So the argument that the patent owner here has is um, that under KSR, this very rigid Rosen-Durling test should be relaxed and more flexible um, than it already is. We had the arguments in February. It sounds like the court is open to, um, the Federal Circuit is open to relaxing that Rosen-Durling test, but I don't think it's going to get away from it altogether. I think it's going to say, you know, in, in, in some instances, um, maybe you don't have, maybe you just have to have a substantially similar primary reference. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, exactly the same or all, nearly, nearly the same. In some instances for the second test, maybe you just look at analogous art or something like that. So I think there's going to be some relaxation of it, but I don't think, if I had to guess what the court's going to do, but I don't think they're going to get rid of the test. And that relaxation would make it easier to challenge design patents, correct? Yeah, which, yes, which have, a, I don't know, I think in the, in the oral argument, the statistics were 2 to 4% of design patents get a rejection on obviousness. So it's, um, that's the concern is it would really open up obviousness for yeah, but this this would also have implications for the litigate litigating of design patents too, right? Correct. Yeah, and it's you know I mean I, I can sort of see the point that you know from a consistency perspective we've got KSR which came from the Supreme Court and we've got this other practice in, in design patents, but you know design patents are very different from utility patents and the scope there is 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 drastically different and so when you have a a super narrow scope. Um, you know, maybe it makes sense to, to have some kind of heightened standard there for, for design patents, right? I mean, you're talking about a picture where if you have a rounded corner as compared to, right, a, a mm. sharpened corner, you don't have infringement. So, you know. Um, and you could go out and find a rounded corner on anything unrelated in, you know, in, in utility that would f fly yeah. or have a much better chance of flying. And you look at, you know, for example, at the PTAB, the lowest institution rate is always designed. It's like 40 percent. Um, so, you know, it, it, it is more difficult to, to invalidate a design patent than it is a utility patent. But again, the scope there is, is so much more narrow. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe that makes sense. And you know, that's my expectation as well. There probably will remain, remain some kind of distinction there. But, you know, maybe the test has sort of drifted to the point where it's a little too rigid right now yeah so i don't know the answer to this so i'm going to deviate from the rule that you don't ask a question to which you don't know what the answer but have either of you guys had occasion to work on a ptab design case i have not scott i have um and like i said it's it's difficult to find prior art because you really do have to find almost the same article of manufacture with the same basic design and then and find almost the same design with the missing feature so it, it's pretty tight and there's only a handful of judges at the PTAB that I think handle these cases so mm -hmm. um, you know that, that could impact whether or not you get instituted as well. Well it's also a different enforcement dynamic altogether a lot of the yeah. folks that get design patents are not getting them to stop their competitors they're getting them to stop the secondary market like in the automobile case for example all those parts have that weird design so that they can get a design patent on it and oh guess what that's the only thing that fits in the space that they've left you under the hood um so they're not but ford's not suing gm on a design patent. ford's and gm are both trying to stop the secondary market it's mechanical interfaces to medical yeah, devices yeah. if you can get 
like you say, the design that just so happens to be the best sort of ergonomic fit. You know, that's that's very. You're valuable. being generous, calling it the best. It's <laughs> best because of the way they've designed because it's everything, functional, yeah. because everything yeah. else. Yeah. But you can't say it's functional because then they they would lose, right? So right. it's no, no, no. We just did it this way. Why? Because we did. And that was an undercurrent in LKQ as well, because there was a a, 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 a secondary market, a manufacturer of I don't know, like bumpers or something like that, or. or um, side panels for cars, and and the point they're making is, hey, this is kind of anti anti competitive because it's impossible to invalidate these patents, but they're they're being used to to, to stop the ability for us to, to operate as a company. Right, right. Okay, we're down to the wire here. So, gentlemen, I'd like to give each of you the opportunity to wrap up with your your final thought. Maybe the question can be, um, if there's one thing that people need to keep their eye on over the next year, you know, until we're back here next year doing this program, talking about patent litigation. And I know we've focused a lot on the, on the, the PTAB end of the litigation because that's what, where a lot of the action is now. What do you think is going to be the big action over the next 12 months? Scott, first. Yeah, I, th I think it just because in, in terms of immediacy and that, you know, these, these things are up at the federal circuit and we have the rule package, I think double patenting is something to watch. Like I said, that Allergan case that was argued last week, the next select case to come up, uh, you know, the minute those decisions are made, they're going to have an impact. And so, uh, you know, unlike a rule package or legislation where we don't know what's going to happen there, there's going to be decisions in those cases. And, uh, you know, while double patenting, especially in the predictable arts, you don't tend to care about it as much as you do. In life sciences, when you're out there litigating and, uh, you know, as Select found out and, and half of your, your case can be thrown out because of, of some of these double patenting issues, it's, it's worth keeping an eye on. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Scott. Steve, final word goes to you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Gene. Um, yeah, double patenting obviously is going, to be, is going to be a big issue. I mean, it's, there's so much going on with it between Select and, and, and the rules package. And, and my view is it's, it's you know, at least for I, – I do – you know, electronics, high tech patents mostly. It's 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 almost pointless a lot of times. Um, and it's just being wielded as a, as a sword against um, patent owners. So it will be easy. It will be interesting to see where that goes. Um, I also think, and, and Scott's written about uh, where Fintiv is going um, before, but I think that'll be kind of a barometer over the next year to see how much Fintiv starts to actually have teeth again and what happens with that with the next administration. I think that. Is something I'll be keeping an eye on to see, you know, how much we're we're, we're bouncing back away from from the current uh, um, current regime. Great, excellent. Well, thank you guys for a wonderful conversation. That brings us to the end of this panel. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Gene.